Okay, we are starting off our technical program right now, and our first speaker is my fellow Ruby Rogue, Avdi Grimm. He lives in Pennsylvania. He, um, he did a really uh, great ebook in the last year called uh, Exceptional Ruby, uh, and did some talks on that last year. I saw him doing that talk at uh, Ruby on Ales, and decided I wanted him to speak here because he, uh, he has a way. So, uh, this morning he's going to be showing you lots of ins and outs of Ruby with a talk entitled Code to Join. So, welcome, Afti. Attributes. 
code, r.code, r.message, but we can also splat that struct out and it just works. It, it splats out into, se into separate variables. Now there's one little problem. Remember the implicit splatting from before. Well, this does not support the implicit splatting out of the box. When we try to do that, it doesn't quite work. But we can fix that. If we go into that struct definition and we alias 2A, it already has a 2A, but we alias that to 2ARI, which it didn't have a 2ARI before. 2ARI, turns out, is the signal to Ruby that implicit splatting is possible. So once we do that, we can instantiate this, this response object, we can splat it out into multiple variables, and it just works. So in our send request method, we just we return a response object that we, we create from that <coughs> code and message. Now the client code that wants to splat that out immediately into multiple variables can do it. The client code that wants to pass it around as an object can do it, can have that too. <coughs> so this is, gives us a way to have multiple return values from a method or a single result object from the same line of code. Magic. This makes me happy. This is awesome. Who knows about YAML store? Raise your hand. Cool, I'm going to be introducing a lot of new people, a lot of people to this today. <clears throat> YAML store is part of the standard library. It is a, a very simple file-based persistence mechanism that Ruby provides for you. And here's how you use it. You instantiate a repository. You give it a file name. Then you open up a transaction block. And inside that transaction block, you can use the repository basically like a hash. It has keys and values. And what I'm doing here is I've got some, some post objects, because everything's a block example in Ruby. And I've just got a, I've got a post key, and I'm putting an array in there, and I'm appending some posts to this repository. When we look at the data that that puts out, that puts in that blog.yml file, it's this really readable YAML, uh, which is very clearly reflects the structure of the objects that we put in there. Now, what if we have a slightly more complex object structure? So. Let's introduce a category to these blog posts. And we're going to have two blog posts now that are both part of the food category. What's that going to do in the, in the output? Let's take a look. So here's the output that's, that's generated. We can see a lot of the data is the same. We've got our two posts in there. In the first post, we've got a category object nested under it. And it's got that funny ID in front of it. And then it's got the information about the category. Then in the second post, it's got a category as well, but it doesn't have, doesn't repeat the category object. It just has a reference to that previous, that previous category object. So it's very smart about dealing with objects that reference other objects. And it's not going to write an object more than once. It'll just uh, put the references back. So objects can re reference each other. It works out very well. So this is pretty awesome. But it's also pretty slow because it's, it's reading and writing YAML all the time. And it turns out that uh, there's, a, there's another library called pstore, which actually YAML store is based on pstore. pstore came first. pstore uses Ruby's binary marshalling format. So if you have trouble with the performance of YAML store, you can just drop pstore in its place and use that. You won't have nice readable output, but uh, in some very informal me measurements I did, uh, it turns out to be much, much faster. So, this is not something that you're going to be putting on your web server and serving out, you know, serving out pages on. But if you have some kind of like local command line application, this is great. It gives you an incredibly simple hash-like persistence mechanism that you barely have to think about. Supports complex object trees. And oh yeah, one more thing: it's PostSQL. <laughs> Series of names one after another. This is um, 
a straight line method, there's no looping or anything involved here, just a, a straight line method, we can call to enum on that met and give it the, the method name, and we get this enumerator thingy back. If we call to a on that enumerator, what do we get? We get an array of the values that this method yielded. So what this enumerator did was it turned our method that yields into an iterable object. So that's kind of cool. I had a problem recently. I had a program that had config files, and I wanted to treat it, I wanted it to treat them kind of like rake treats its config files. So I had these files called .rutrc, and I wanted it to, like rake, I wanted to search up the current directory hierarchy. So if it didn't find one, uh, a config file in the current directory, it would find one in the parent directory, or in the grandparent directory. But not only that, I wanted it not just to find one, but I wanted it to find all of them, all the way up to the root, and then uh, basically merge them together. Turns out there's a method in the standard library that got me most of the way there. The path name library um, has a method called ascend. So you call ascend on a directory. And it yields once for the current directory, and then once for the parent directory, the grandparent directory, and so on up to the root. So this was great. It got me most of the way there. But this wasn't exactly the way I wanted to iterate, because I kind of wanted to collect an array along the way in if I found one of those config files. So here's what I did. And uh, we'll go through this uh, line by line. I took that current directory, and rather than just saying .ascend, I turned the ascend method into an enumerator. So now I had an, a, an iterable object over the, the ancestor tree of this, or the ancestor path of this directory. <coughs> And then I got, and now that I had uh, an enumerator, I had all these wonderful enumerable methods available to me. And the one that I wanted to use was each with object. So I said each with object, I passed in an empty array, and then I went through that, I iterated through that ancestor tree uh, path, and at each, at each point I checked to see if the config file was there, and if it was, I added it to the array. And then this whole block returned the array, it worked out great. So enumerator and two enum, you can turn any method that yields into an iterable series. And it makes all the power of enumerable available to that series. This is awesome, it makes me happy. Let's talk about break. What can we say about break? It's a keyword, it breaks out of loops, what do you do? Well, let's take a look at that method we introduced earlier again. Remember, just a straight line method, no looping or anything. It's just yielding names one after another. What if we introduce, what if we use that method and we put, pass it a block which will break after two names? So you can see the output at the bottom, it gets two names, and then it's done. What if we just do that? Let's take a look at that. We started going down, executing this straight line method, we got down two lines into the method, and then we did it. We forced an early exit from this method, and we did it without a return, a throw, or a raise. So that's kind of interesting. But this might raise a question in your mind. That's kind of interesting, but it kind of, sounds kind of dangerous, too, because uh, what if that method had some important cleanup that it needed to do at the end in an insure block? Does that mean it would just be Thrown away, it would just be ignored. Now let's try it. Here's a version that has an insure block which always puts out a last name. Put the exact same block into it. Now our output has three names. So what just happened? We forced an early exit from that method in the right in the middle, but then Ruby jumped down to the insure block, executed that, and then finished breaking out of the method. And this is pretty cool because what this means to me is that Ruby has my back. Even if I'm doing weird things with break, it still has my back. It's going to make sure that stuff that I put in place to clean up, clean up after myself is going to be called. <clears throat> now, what if we wanted to capture a particular name 
out of this iteration. So we have a regular expression. We want to capture the name, a name that the first name that begins with S. And we could do it like this. We could set up a result variable that starts out as nil, and then we could we could pass this thing into our block, and when we find a match, we assign name to the result, and then we break out. And this works, but it's kind of clunky. Another way to do it. What's different here? I am, this time, I'm passing a value to the break keyword. How many people know that you can pass a value to break? To break? A good amount of people, that's awesome. <clears throat> what does this do? Not only does it break out in the middle of execution, it effectively overrides the method's return value. So I have forced this method to return the thing that I'm interested in, not the thing that it's interested in returning, or that it returned by default. Let's look, take a look at a, maybe a more useful example. <clears throat> Let's say we want to search through the lines of a file for a particular string. If we, when we find that string, we return it. If we find the matching string, we return it. And then we're done. And this is a classic application of, you know, you typically use like a detect for this. But there's another requirement here. We also don't want to do this forever. We, if it's a really long file, we don't want to just keep searching through it. We want to give up after the first hundred lines. Here's a way we can do it using a break with a, with a value. <clears throat> we take that file, we get an enumerator over its lines, like the length of lines, then we call detect. And down at the bottom of that detect block, we have our usual detect logic, where we say, you know, it, here's, here's the, the test of whether the line is matched. And if the line is matched, then it'll return the matching line, which is what we expect of, of detect. But we also have this break line in there, which checks the line number count and breaks out early with this special line not found value <clears throat> if, uh, if we pass that, that uh, max line count. And as a result, we go through the file, if it doesn't find that, that matching string in the first hundred lines, rather than having to have some logic later to replace you know, the nil that we got out of detect, we've forced, the, we've forced that default to be this special string line not found that we wanted to use. All right. Now let's talk about subclassing modules. Let's take the example of a really basic role-playing game. We've got characters, and they've got a character class, and they've got a character race. And so here we're setting up a particular character who is a human wizard, so we've got a human class, a human, human race, a uh, wizard class. And here's what we'd like to happen. We'd like the character to have some attributes of its own, like a name. We'd like it to then delegate attributes that it doesn't have defined on itself to either its class or its race. Here's one way we can do it. We can use forwardable. We can say, we could, we could extend our, our character class with forwardable, and then we can define some delegators. So we delegate strength to race, we delegate charisma to the character class. This works fine. But then one day we decide we want to add a new attribute to, to the race. We want to add constitution as well. And then we have to, after we add that, we have to go in, back into our character class and add constitution to the list of delegators for, for race. And we realize that every time we add a new attribute to either character class or character race, we're going to have to add another, um, another delegator. And that's, that kind of sucks because that's, you know, that's repeating ourselves. That's, that's knowledge in two places of, of the same thing. Every change has to be made twice. <clears throat> we might briefly consider using simple delegator because simple delegator delegates any missing message to a delegate object. Problem here is that it's just one delegate object. 
and we have two things that we want to possibly delegate to, either the race or the class. So here's a way we can solve this. We create a new kind of module by subclassing the module class. We give it a, a custom initializer. It's going to take the attribute of the object that it should be delegating to. And we're going to save that off in an instance variable. Then we're going to call the, the base initializer for module, which if you've ever done module dot, uh, module dot new, you know it takes a block, which is the, the implementation of the module. And that didn't all fit on this slide, so we're going to go to the next slide, where we are defining a method missing in that body. Let's go through that bit by bit. First, we find the target of our of our delegation. So we send that attribute name, like race or care class, to self. And that gives us a delegate, a concrete delegation target object. Then we ask that target if it responds to the missing message. If it does, we forward that message on to the, to the target along with its arguments. If it doesn't, we just pass it on up the ancestor chain. And for, uh, for general readability, we also add a nice 2S message to this. So to use this, we go back to our character class, and we include instantiations of this new kind of module. So we are creating modules on the fly here, and one of them is a delegate, delegator module to race, and one of them is a delegator module to character class. And if we take a look at the player's class ancestors, we can see very clearly what's going on here now, because we defined that nice 2S method. The message, when a message is sent to this object, it's going to start out looking at itself, character, own class, and then it's going to look at the delegate module for character class, and then it's going to look at the delegate module for race, and then it's going to go on up the chain to the other ancestors. And here's how it works in practice. We have our player character. It has its own attribute name. When we call strength on it, that's delegated to the race. When we call charisma on it, it's delegated to the class. And we've defined kind of a chain of responsibility here. We start with self. Then we start with, and then we go to one attribute, check if that attribute supports it. We go to another attribute, check if that attribute supports it. And then we go on up the, the chain. And so we have, we have basically defined a new kind of, of delegation mechanism here. But we've hooked it into the Ruby, the standard Ruby uh, message searching system. So by subclassing module, we can create a new kind of module. <clears throat> we can add state to the new modules that we create. And this, as I said, this enabled, uh, enables us to do crazy things like enable completely new types of message delegation. <coughs> this is awesome. This is the kind of thing that when I realize I can do this, it just makes me grin. Now my favorite idiom of all in Ruby is minus one. Mats is nice, so we are nice. But sometimes we're not so nice. Sometimes we're not so happy. Maybe technical debt is getting you down. Maybe community drama. We're, we're a passionate community. Any kind of passionate community of creators is going to have drama. Maybe the drama is bumming you out a bit. What do you do? What do you do? I say, to balance out that negativity, it is essential to practice joyful coding. How do we do that? Well, there's no metric for joyful code. The only thing that makes code joyful, the only thing that makes it delightful, is the fact that it is shared with someone else. 
So if you want to feel good about your craft again, because you're feeling down and you want to pick me up about, you know, about the thing that you do every day, pick one person, one person that maybe knows a little bit less than you do about some area, and give them a wow moment. Show them something awesome. I promise you will feel better. So I want to thank you for allowing me to increase my joy by sharing these items with you. And I hope that I've inspired you to turn around and increase somebody else's joy the same way. Thank you very much.
Okay. <laughs> so that, that was, that was basically the main question is, is uh, uh, are you and Charles on speaking terms? Uh, and so, Possibly not anymore. <laughs> okay, I, I'm taking the last question. Um, have you ever used HyperCard? No, no, I, I did not. Be, because, because the module subclassing that you showed uh, looks exactly like HyperCard's containment style chain of responsibility delegation. So I just looked at it and said, oh yeah, cool. Only vaguely related to that, I know we talked about the cell system uh, in the past, and if anybody can show me an elegant way to do something like this only to get self-style delegation, where, where self, self is always self, which I don't know a better way of explaining it, or, you know, where, where, where when you delegate to another object, self is still the same object instead of that other object, I would love to see it, because I still haven't come up with a clean way to do that. Yeah, tricky. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're, we're done with questions. Uh, we're going to do a break and we'll be back at uh, 10.30. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.